let's give you a hypothetical right here. If someone's established business, you make over $100 million a year in a market like the United States. When you have a bad market, most likely your numbers are going to start getting hurt. Your growth is going to slow down. Your numbers are going to start going backwards. But on the flip side, if you're in a new market, let's say you just expand to the United Kingdom, which has a good GDP, and you're at $0 in revenue, good market, bad market, it doesn't matter. You're going to close something. You should be. So you're going to be better off than where you were before. I have found that there's a lot of talk about blitz scaling, but before you scale, you have to do unscalable stuff. Would you agree or you don't agree? And why or why not? Depends on the business. If I'm trying to start a software company from day one, and it's a me too software company, I'm creating a CRM, let's say competing with Salesforce and HubSpot and the list goes on and on. Zoho, Sugar CRM. You may not need to do as much manual stuff because you're in a older industry that's established that already has a lot of the systems and processes built. So you may not have to worry too much about scalability because you can get that early on. On the flip side, if you're doing something new, a lot of times you're going to have to grind it out and things aren't as scalable as they should be. So when you started, did you start off with scalability in mind or did you just start off with wanting to solve it? When I started off, I just thinking about making money and that was it. There was no like, oh, I need to make it scalable. Oh, I need to make it super efficient. And so my margins, my profit, I'm just like, how much revenue can I make? And how much of that drops to the bottom line and goes in my pocket? That was it. When you're starting off, it's for most people, it's much more basic. In your conversation with Matt Gray, I noticed you said one of your pet peeves is people don't make revenue fast enough and they don't ship fast enough. They sit in analysis for a long time. And I have to confess I was guilty of this and I'm still sometimes guilty of it. How do you bring yourself to get to done and not get caught up in the whole perfection thing? That's a tough one. And I don't know the honest answer for that. And here's why I'll say that. So when you're going out there and just trying to get things done, you just have to have that mentality that it's okay not to be perfect and just ship stuff and get feedback. But I don't know the real secret or solution. I think it's more mentality than anything else. Not putting a rocket into space. If it falls, there's not that many repercussions. First, rocket into space, sure, people could die. You know, when you're talking about building a software company and you have no paying customers, who cares? Just get it out there and get feedback. What do you have to lose? And I think that's where people make the mistake because they overanalyze. They genuinely just overanalyze. And I don't know why, instead of just trying to get it out there, again, no secret. Get shit out there, you do okay. You don't get shit out there, you don't do it okay. Not rocket science. If it's not perfect, you got it out there, you adapt. You learn from your mistakes. If it's great, cool, lucky you, because most people don't experience that right away, right? Like, it's more of a mental thing. And can you get over it? I really like how honest and open you're being in this conversation. So thank you. Something you also said was one of your biggest mistakes was not being focused enough when you were younger and you are more focused now. Oh, yeah. In episode 147, I spoke to Noah Kagan about this as well. And he said being able to say no is an important skill. How do you say no? And more importantly, what things do you say yes to? What sort of filters do you have in business when picking projects? So I say no to most things and I'll least say yes to my main business and that's it. So I was at a dinner one time and this guy does not remember. I was at a group dinner one time. And there was a guy named Brian Lee there. Brian Lee created Shoe Dazzle with Kim Kardashian, LegalZoom, and Honest Company and a few other companies. Honest Company is with Jessica Alba. That's right. Brian taught me something and I didn't understand it back then. And I took the advice for granted. And when I say I took it for granted, I was like, oh yeah, I learned this great piece of advice. I'm going to use it. And I didn't take it from granted from a mental note standpoint, but like bullshit on me for not using it. Right. I did not use it. And I was super arrogant. I was like, oh, I'm good. I, I know what I'm doing. But Brian once said, if your company is growing at a nice pace, just have laser focus and keep doing what you're doing. The moment your growth slows down, start looking at other things to do to speed it up. So NP Digital, all right? You're based in Australia, right? Yep. We have Australia Division. I don't know if you knew that. We have NP Digital in Australia as well. I do because right? I'm a There you go. And Dan ends up running it. That's right. So, and we have a lot of different divisions. The economy is bad. I'm not here to tell you we're booming when a lot of people in marketing are struggling. I know most of the competitors and I know a lot of their numbers because they share. 
Did you know our international, when you look at year to date numbers and you compare them year over year has grown roughly 74% wow. in this kind of economy. So what are we doing to create more growth? We started the year with Australia, okay? UK, I'm excluding US, but Australia, UK, Brazil, India, Canada, US would make it six. Okay. We also had Germany, but the Germany guy didn't work out and he didn't want to do really any work. We both decided to part ways, not trying to talk trash. It was just the reality of it. Yeah. He just wanted something else in life. So those are the five regions we're in. Now we're in roughly May 19th, May 20th. I don't know your time zone is May 20th while recording this. So you got those five regions, six, if you include the United States, we've already added Italy, Spain, Singapore, Mexico, Colombia, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Japan. We're about to add France. So now you're looking at nine regions that we've popped up in roughly five months. Wow. And the growth isn't coming from these new nine that we've popped up. It's coming from the existing five. And we're like, uh-huh. The revenue really is international, which we knew, but we needed to see the data because it's expensive to spend all this money to expand overseas. It costs millions of dollars per region. Our original projections were a million per region, but that's not the case, sadly. It's much more. So when you start adding them all in, and by the end of this year, including the United States, we'll probably be somewhere around 23 to 25 regions that will be in countries. When I say regions. Like we're pushing hard for future growth and international expansion. So what's driving this growth? How are you having this success when the rest of the market is shrinking? We're not just focused on the US. Let's give you a hypothetical right here. If someone's established business, you make over a hundred million dollars a year in a market like the United States. When you have a bad market, most likely your numbers are gonna start getting hurt. Your growth is gonna slow down, your numbers are gonna start going backwards. But on the flip side, if you're in a new market, let's say you just expand to the United Kingdom, which has a good GDP, and you're at zero dollars in revenue, good market, bad market, doesn't matter. You're going to close something. You should be. So you're going to be better off than where you were before. And in a good market, you'll close more. In a bad market, you'll close, but it'll be slower. And that's why we're growing still at a decent clip is because we're adding a ton internationally. You were not seeing the revenue from all these international regions yet because we've been adding so many. I think not next year, 2025 will be our year. Okay. Superstition. I just knocked on wood. But okay, let's talk about revenue versus profit. I put on my CPA or my MBA hat, and I can tell you that if a business is doing 10 million, 100 million, whatever a year, but if they're spending 11 million or 111 million to make that revenue, you're worse off than the guy on the side of the street in the cardboard box because you're broke. Unless in theory, yes. Unless your company is valued on revenue, which some okay. are like a lot of SaaS are, but the public markets now want profit and investors now want profit. Unless you're growing like 40, 50% year over year, they're a little flexible. But if you don't have those growth numbers, which most people don't, uh, they want profit. And then the other problem that's changed is before they were okay with no profit if you have 40, 50% growth. But if you keep having 40, 50% growth and your losses just keep compounding each year faster than your growth, there's a problem. Right? Exactly. So that's but my yeah, point. I'm a Gujarati and you're familiar <laughs> with my kind. And we look at, we were taught at a young age that. A business is someone that makes profit, not right. revenue, revenue right. is an irrelevant number. So let's talk about that. I want to just drill down to that. How do you ensure profitability? Because I'm sick and tired of hearing people talking about revenue numbers. Revenue is not important and it doesn't impress me. What impresses me is profit. And I know you're profitable, but my question is, how do you focus on profitable revenue, as it were, and as importantly, if not more importantly, how do you ensure cash flow is always healthy? Good financial team. They do unit economics and they make sure everything we do is profitable and good leadership. See, my CEO was the president of iProspect, which is an agency, global agency. He managed, I don't know how many thousands of people, but a lot. And he worked at a publicly traded company and one of, was one of their best divisions. So he had to run things 
based on a quarterly basis. Now we don't run things on a quarterly basis, but you got to do, you got to optimize for revenue and profit and th things like that. So that's important. The other one to think about for us is in this economy, our profit is going down drastically, not because we can't maintain it and grow it. It's going down because we're investing so heavily internationally. And technically that's not considered profit. When you look at accounting rules, we still have great profit, but we're taking the cash flow. We're looking at the profit, we're paying taxes on it, and then we're reinvesting it for international growth, right? Based on our auditors, RSM and BDO, that's the correct way we need to do it. So technically we still have great profit. We have terrible cash flow because we're taking all the profits and reinvesting them for international expansion and growth, which is going to make us suffer from an income standpoint for the next two years, which I'm okay with. And I've got to say that I doubled revenue for a few years in a row, which was great, but I was reinvesting all of my profits back into the business. And that is what I've found. If you want to drive growth, you've got to reinvest. Would you agree? You do. It's painful, but you got it. <laughs> I wish that wasn't the case. I'd be much happier with my pocketbook if that wasn't the case, but eh, that's life. And you know what, if you love what you're doing and you believe in it, go for it. And, and you're building an asset, right? And if you love, as you say, if you love what you're doing, you don't work a day in your life, which is the case for me. I used to hate working in the corporate world as an analyst, but ever since I started Productive Insights, I've never been happier. So I couldn't agree more with that. You mentioned you've hired good quality financial people. Tell me a little bit about your approach to hiring, because I think hiring is one of the most important skills when it comes to building a great company with a great culture, which also your press release said that one of the reasons you were voted for the Inc. Workplace thing for the second year in a row is because you have a good culture. So talk to us about hiring and culture. So I'm not the right person to talk to about culture. I don't want to bullshit you and tell you this out of critical good culture. My co-founder does all that. Hiring, we use one simple strategy. We look to see who's worked for multiple of our competitors, because if they work for multiple competitors, they know your space. We look for people who stay there for a while because that means they're loyal. And we look for people who've got promoted consistently at our competitors. So if you're hiring someone for a role that they've done in the past and they've worked at your competitors and they've continually got it promoted, that means other people found them valuable. See, when you interview, people tend to bullshit. Oh, I yeah. did really well, and I dropped this revenue, and I'm the best, and this is why this company was successful. The truth is usually somewhere in between what they're saying and what the company says. And when you hire someone who's worked at your competition or multiple competitors, they've gone continually promoted at both places, it means other people found them to be valuable. Those are the people you typically want because when they say they can do something, usually they can or else they wouldn't be continually promoted. That's a strategy to hire. Hit them up on LinkedIn. And we don't ever say, hey, app, you know, love what you're doing. We want to hire you. That We found that doesn't work. We'll be like, hey, Ash, love what you've done in Australia at this ad agency, assuming we're hiring you to run an ad agency in Australia. We're actually looking for someone just like you who has your skill set. Do you know anyone who would be a great fit? And that's it. And then a lot of times you, Ash, will be like, actually, I'm interested. And right. that's how we reach out to people. And if we meet you directly and say, come work for us, we found it to be too direct and not work as well. That also applies very well to sales, right? Because when you say to somebody, I have a membership program, for example, I often reach out and say, I'm looking to get other members just like you, because similar to a company, I think if you want to build a great membership, and I've got some really great members in my membership program, you got to handpick the people and you got to build a good culture. You got to bring the right members in because one crappy member can just poison the well. It's a very nice, non-invasive way to recruit members as it were. Yes. I didn't know you had a co-founder. I assumed you were the only founder of NP Digital. I'm majority, I own majority of the company by far. And I have a co-founder, his name is Mike. Amazing guy, has done extremely well in operations. Uh, great background for recruiting and sales. And then funny enough, my CEO is also named Mike. Okay. 